Hi, and welcome to the Vintage Computer Federation YouTube channel. Your support helps us with creating videos just like this one and restoring vintage computers for all the world to enjoy. So please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, it's very nice to see so many folks, folks here. Um, I'll be talking about the Sphere 1 computer, the first modern microcomputer. Uh, but first, this is a computer that everybody here is familiar with. On the right, that's the, the Altair 8800. Uh, the man on the left is Ed Roberts. He is the founder of MITS and the inventor of the Altair. Uh, in late, the Altair was is reasonably known as kickstarting the microcomputer revolution. Uh, much later on, in the mid-1990s, uh, there was an interview with Ed Roberts, a historian interviewed him, and asked him about competition in the very early days uh, of his work. Uh, and he said this, uh, one that was introduced within months after we came out with the Altair that got a lot of splash is the Sphere machine. That would have been the only machine at that time that I know of that we considered any kind of competitor. It's a strong statement from the father of the microcomputer revolution. This is a picture of a man named Mike Wise. Uh, Mike was the inventor of the Sphere machine, the founder of that company. Uh, and Mike Wise, uh, a few years after Ed Roberts' interview, Mike Wise stood here. I mean, not exactly here, but on the stage at the Vintage Computer Festival, the third annual one in 1999. It was held at the Santa Clara Convention Center. Uh, and there was a day of sessions, and some of those sessions were recorded and videoed, and uh, some of them weren't, and Mike's was not. Uh, I find that, I, my reaction to that is I'm surprised that somebody who was considered this chief competitor to Altair came and gave a talk about his work on Sphere, and nobody recorded it. Uh, there's a hint as to why in uh, Roberts, the rest of Roberts' interview. He also said, nobody ever saw an operating unit. I've heard that nobody ever saw a production version of the Sphere. I assure you, this is not true. They were real, and they were spectacular. Uh, there were operating units in production versions, but this does point to one of the reasons why the Sphere is uh, somewhat obscure uh, today. I am here to talk to you about uh, the most important computer that nobody's ever heard of, uh, the Sphere machine out of, out of, uh, out of Salt Lake City. I have. I have, the title of the presentation is The First Modern Microcomputer. That is intentionally provocative. Uh, I made that up based on vibes only because it's an interesting way of looking at this incredibly fertile period of history, uh, this, these sort of few years between the mid-70s and the late 70s when all this innovation and interesting stuff was kind of emerging from everywhere. Um, uh, I think the Sphere was, one of the reasons it was interesting is I, I really think it was a machine of the hobbyist era. It, it, it lived that way, but it pointed both in its technology and in its, its uh, positioning and marketing, it pointed the way towards the, the forthcoming personal computer industry. Sphere itself was not around to, to see that transition, um, but I think it's a, a sort of underrated, a bit of an underrated machine. So uh, I'm going to talk about what it was, uh, why it was great. Uh, why it's, why, a little bit about why it's obscure and disappeared. Uh, my interest here is I'm an engineer, I'm also a historian. Um, I found some parts for a Sphere computer on the sidewalk thrown out last year. Um, this, is, this is the kind of obscurity that we're talking about. So in the, in the uh, effort of bringing it home and trying to get it working um, as a project, I, I discovered what I thought was this really interesting untold story of this company and this computer and this community um, that there is, wasn't that much documentation about. So that began this very large project that I've been, that I've been involved in, uh, and it's involved hundreds of hours of research and dozens of interviews, and I'm, I'm working on a book. So I'm writing a book about the sphere, the company, the computer, and the community, and a little bit about, uh, uh, about that at the end. Um, but uh, before we do that, oops, let's go back, go back to the 1960s. Here's Mike Wise, again, now he's a teenager. Uh, 
Uh, he is in, he's in a small town in Washington state. He was born in Germany. He's the son of uh, uh, someone in the Army, the Army Air Force. His dad was in the Army Air Force. So the family moved, and moved around all over the place, all over the world, eventually settled in a uh, small town Washington state. Uh, Mike goes to high school there. He graduates in, uh, in 1967, and he decides he's going to go to university at Brigham Young University, uh, BYU in Provo, Utah. Uh, Mike's family were uh, members of the Latter-day Saints Mormon Church, and that was kind of a, a, an, easy, an easy choice for him. He was a man of faith his entire life. Uh, so uh, so Mike, goes to, uh, Mike goes to BYU. Uh, this is not a picture of Mike, but it is a picture of BYU. This is the, they had a burgeoning computer science program at the time in the late 60s, and this was uh, one of their IBM machines. It's likely that Mike sat in this, in this very chair, uh, learning, about, learning about these computers and becoming, and becoming passionate about them. Uh, after, so he spends five years at BYU, and he doesn't graduate. Instead, he sort of gets, gets roped into being an instructor. He's so passionate about this stuff, so he kind of helps teach in the computer science department. Uh, but he gets married, and it's time to go get a job. So he leaves by BYU, and he and his and his young family uh, move to the small town of or small city of Bountiful, Utah. Uh, Bountiful is up there. That's Northern Salt Lake. You can see Bountiful just up Interstate 15 uh, from Salt Lake. It's 10 or 15 uh, miles away. It is the second settlement uh, in Utah after Salt Lake City. Uh, it's small town, so Mike gets a Mike gets an engineering uh, engineer job. He's a computer analyst, uh, but Mike is very excited about microcomputers. He has been watching, as many people did, the 4004 come out, the 8008 come out, the 8080 comes out, and the Altair comes out. And he thinks, you know what? It's time. I need to jump in. I have this idea. I want to build this. I want to take what I know about big machines and what I can figure out about microprocessors and make like a computer that's just a box that does stuff for people. Uh, so. He builds, so he leaves his job, his wife works at a hospital, and she supports the family through this sort of startup transition, and he found Sphere, and Sphere uh, is named, uh, so named because it is, a, it is a shape with no edges, it can contain everything, it was an ambition to cover the world in this technology that was going to change the way everybody worked, uh, primarily. Um, so he begins Sphere, and uh, he has a number of people who kind of begin the company with him. I love this photograph. Uh, Mike is on the left. He's in the leisure suit. He loves wearing that leisure suit in the official promo photos, so you'll see that more than once. Um, but you can kind of tell from this photo what everybody's role at the company was. So Mike's the visionary. He's the founder. He's on the left. Monroe Tyler's in the middle. He's the hardware engineering guy. Uh, and on the right is Doug Hansey. He's marketing, sales, and strategy. Uh, these were young men. These were men who were about, they were all about 25 in this picture. So just like startups today and, and startups in Silicon Valley at that time in the mid-70s, they they, these were young folks. They were passionate about changing the world. They worked with the Motorola 6800 chip. The Altair, of course, used the 8080. Motorola introduced this uh, similar 8-bit chip about the same time in 1974. It's a little easier to program, and Motorola was willing to give them a was willing to give them a hand because they were interested in getting stuff out in the world that used their hardware. Uh, so they went with this with this uh, with this chip, and their first advertisement shows up in uh, July of 1975. So this is now five, six months after the revolutionary Altair ad goes up on the popular electronics cover. This is an ad in Radio Electronics. It's small. It's near the back. There was also an ad in the Homebrew Computer, uh, Homebrew Computer Newsletter uh, for that month. Uh, but this one, this one was kind of cool. It advertises this, this system, and they always come back to system sphere. Uh, it costs 650 bucks. That's about $3,500 today. It was a little bit more expensive than the Altair, uh, but it promised to do more stuff. Uh, it had the 6800 processor. It had 4K of RAM, uh, some ROM, some other stuff. They promise a lot of things sometimes in these early ads that weren't quite worked out yet, uh, but this was the ad. Uh, and it's important to put this in historical context uh, for those who weren't there, and I was not. Uh, before this ad shows up, this, you might think, well, why isn't this in Byte Magazine? Wasn't that the place to put ads like this? Well, Byte Magazine didn't exist yet. This was prior to that. So uh, the Altair was out. You had some other smaller kit mini computers, uh, sorry, microcomputers and small mini computers out in the world. And you had the Altair, and then you kind of had the Sphere. And the IMSI was not out yet. Uh, the Soul was not out yet. Uh, the Apple One was a year away. 
when this ad shows up. So the checks start flowing into Bountiful Utah, and this was very typical at the time. These companies would like put an ad and they'd be like, well, we're gonna make this thing. We got this idea, people start sending checks, and they start getting all this money. And now they gotta do something with all that money. And that money was enough to finance a company, typically. You could really kickstart something with just checks from people wanting your product, but you needed to then invest that money and turn it into the product to sell them. Uh, so they begin work on this, and uh, this is a promo shot of, of a Sphere 1 computer. It's, this is mostly what it looked like when it was kind of finally complete. There are different configurations, we'll get into that. Uh, but as you can see, it looks like a terminal, it looks like kind of a generic terminal, but it wasn't. Uh, it, was a, it was a microcomputer and it could do stuff. You turned it on and you got a blinking cursor. And that was, and that was really novel then uh, for a microcomputer, something you could either build yourself or buy as an assembled thing and run in your home. Uh, it was one box and you plugged it in and turned it on and you got a cursor and you could tell it to do stuff. And that was very different from the Altair uh, with the switches and lights and the other front panel machines. Um, uh, so, they, so here's Mike again, again, the leisure suit. Um, they, here he is with a, standing with the, the prototype of the machine. Uh, so they begin working on this and they hire, they hire up some people and they're working out of Mike's house in Bountiful and this is, this is the standard kind of thing to do in an early startup company. Uh, so they're, they're doing that, but eventually, in fact, Byte Magazine does show up, and Sphere is there in the first issue, as they were in many of the, the early issues. Uh, here's a two-page spread, uh, advertising, now they're, now they're kind, of, kind of talking about different tiers of their system, and they're clearly tinkering around with what the casework is, is going to look like. Uh, they talk about the system concept, and the system concept, it keeps, they keep coming back to this, and I think, it's, I think it's interesting and important. They didn't see this as, they didn't really see it as a hobbyist tool uh, or a toy, and it's clear that it was used that way uh, because most of the people who were involved in this stuff at the time were kind of hobbyists, but uh, the, the two folks who were doing most sales and marketing had come from Xerox where they'd been taught to sell facsimile and photocopy machines uh, to commercial businesses and they kind of had this sense of like the needs of, a, of an office and the needs of a company and they were really trying to push, trying to push into that world at this very early, at this very early moment. So they take the prototype and they go on the road. This is San Francisco City Hall. This is the entry to Brooks Hall, a no longer extant con, uh, exhibit hall. They go down to WestCon 75. It was in the fall of 1975. It was a big convention. They don't have the money or the lead time to spend on a booth in the exhibit hall, so they bring a motor home. They drive it. They call it the truck. They drive it down. They park it right outside. They put a sandwich board there, and they say, come on in and see the sphere. And so people come in and will walk in, and they'll, they'll see the sphere. And during this trip, they also make a side trip out to the Homebrew Computer Club down, down here in the peninsula where they demo the sphere for the folks who are there. Uh, that group includes Steve Wozniak who recalled it in an interview later. But finally, the company is starting to ship out actual kits and actual computers. One of the very first people to buy one is this fellow. His name is Scott Adams. He's not the Dilbert Scott Adams. He's the one that invented a bunch of adventure games in the late 1970s. Uh, here he is a little bit, a little bit later in the 80s. Uh, he claims to have been their first customer. I don't see any reason not to believe him. He certainly was one of the very first to, to get a kit in the mail. He lived in Antigua on a military base, and so he had access to all sorts of hardware, uh, and that was able to help him build the kit because not everything always works the first time when you're building a complicated kit. And you know, we get back a little bit to, to Ed Roberts's observation there. But uh, among other things, what Scott would have gotten the mail is a kit for, I'll show you the kit parts for a keyboard because I think this is kind of fun. Uh, so among all the other stuff you get, the keyboard included, here's an unpopulated circuit board. They'd prepped the board and we're done the run and so this is in the box. Also in the box is the parts. Uh, a lot of companies who did kits would do parts in little baggies and Sphere had this kind of neat way of taking a, like an inch thick piece of styrofoam and stapling a photocopy of like the outlines of the parts and the names. They'd staple it on there and they'd stick them in there and they'd like plastic wrap the whole thing. So you kind of pull it out and know exactly what it was you were working with. Up in the corner, I don't know if you can see, it says SAC. 80 key switches, 90 key tops, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, here was the sack. It included every individual key switch, all of which had to be soldered individually onto the board. This is just the keyboard. You probably had other parts you needed to put together too. Uh, here's a sphere put together uh, in the, in, in back in the day, there's the keyboard in the bottom left uh, as it's connected to a couple of the boards standing up in a card cage. Uh, we'll get to a little bit of that, a little bit of that later. But I do want to tell you what you could get when you were buying a sphere. 
uh, there was a single, the Sphere used different names and numbers over the years for these, so if you are familiar at all with some of their advertising, it gets a little confusing, and some of them are all the same things, but essentially, uh, they had a single board configuration they promised early on. It's unclear whether they really ever sold any of these, but the idea was you could get a single board, it would have a teletype interface, it had 4K RAM on it, so it kind of, it, it could work as a computer on its own with one board. It would come with a power supply and a keyboard, and you could either get it as a kit or assembled, in which case you get the case with the CRT. Uh, here's the CPU board. Uh, down the bottom, there's the Motorola 6800. Uh, you can see a, uh, the long line of the Texas Instruments uh, DRAM chips over on the side, and in the middle are four uh, EEPROMs that hold the ROM from the company, or of course you can rewrite them with something that, uh, something that you think is more convenient. It came with the keyboard, as we saw. Uh, here it is with the case on it. I like, uh, there's a lot of cool stuff on here. There's a four arrow keys and a numeric keyboard. There's a lot going on here. Uh, there's the fact that there's an individual line feed and carriage return button, meaning that you could choose your line endings however you liked, I find very charming. The other important thing about the keyboard, uh, and this is something that Mike Wise was very proud of until, uh, through, through his entire life, uh, it had a three finger soft reset. And Mike would always claim that he invented Control-Alt-Delete in 1975. Uh, it was, as far as I can tell, the first example of, of quite this sort of thing. A soft reset, again, for folks who weren't there. Uh, you would not have either available mass storage or fast mass storage. And so you'd be doing your work and you needed to get it back to a known state. So you wouldn't want to cold power off the system, you'd want to reset it. There was very often a momentary switch or a button on a, a box or a panel that would reset the CPU without flushing the memory. Uh, Sphere didn't have a front panel, they wanted to do it from the keyboard, they didn't want to make it too easy, so you didn't want it, so you didn't hit it by accident. So uh, they figured out they're going to use stuff, you need two hands, three fingers, and you're probably not going to do it by accident. So if you push control, shift, and reset at the same time, that was hardwired through some gates in the keyboard hardware and that would pull the CPU reset line low and you'd be back to your known state in the firmware. Here's the power supply, here's the inside of it. This thing was huge. So the photos of the sphere show the case with the keyboard looks all sleek. There was no power supply inside that box. The power supply was a brick that you put on the floor. It was larger than a toaster, made of sheet metal, had three transformers, weighed a ton. It, you had to build it yourself if you got the kit uh, with point to point wiring. It was a mostly off the shelf design. Um, it was probably a little underpowered, but it, but it did 5 and 12 volts positive and negative regulated on a pigtail up to the, up to the, the machine. Uh, unlike an S100 machine, which then regulated voltage independently, uh, the Sphere did all that in the power supply in some ways like a bit of a, like a, bit of a, later, a later machine. There's the other side. You can see the um, voltage regulators using the case as a heat sink. It's super sexy to have under your desk. That's the single board configuration. Then they had the entry level configuration. This is kind of the interesting one. So same CPU board, different firmware. They call it the PDS. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, and they added a second board, a CRT module that was a, a, video, a video driver. Uh, the Sphere had video mapped memory memory mapped video. I always get that one wrong. Uh, so it wasn't it was structured like a teletype, like, like some similar machines were at the time. You could access any location on the screen by writing to the equivalent address, so the cursor could move around the entire screen. This also meant you could make games with it. Um, this, was, this was pretty novel. Uh, even the Apple One, again, a year later, did not have, uh, did not have memory mapped video in this way. Um, so, uh, this was, and it was very similar to uh, the processor technology VDM1 that was sort of designed in a contemporary way by Lee Felsenstein, who was uh, around at the festival this weekend, uh, incredibly. Um, so, so the Sphere had uh, the ability to do this, and it had uh, new firmware with it. Uh, there's the video board. Uh, the, there's some static, the four static RAM chips over there on the side. It used the Signetics uh, 2513 the same way the Apple machines did. It was an off-the-shelf uh, character generator part. There's your entry level configuration. But then they'd sell you a memory board if you wanted it. You could add up, you could add more memory as much as you wanted, really, in increments of about 4K, but the board would hold 16K. And there it is. It's a whole bunch of DRAM chips on it. Super interesting. Uh, Finally, we get into what, what became kind of the, the, the sweet spot configuration, which included the serial interface with cassette firmware. 
that was not available on the when the machine launched because the cassette format hadn't been decided. Uh, I don't know if you were at Lee Felsen's science talk yesterday. He described uh, being at the Kansas City Standards meeting where they decided what the frequency bands would be to do cassette data storage at 300 baud. Mike Wise was also there, as was Bill Gates. Uh, the leading lights of the industry came together to figure out how to put stuff on tape. Uh, and not everybody followed that standard to the letter. In fact, it was very slow at 300 baud, so uh, not many people ended up doing it, but Sphere did. So Sphere used the Kansas City standard out of the box, uh, and that's what this, that's what this board, the SIM board, uh, is, capable of, is capable of supporting. And if you had other serial needs, you could you know, wire them in here too. This came with another little EEPROM that would have had some routines to drive the cassette board. Finally, we had the Sirius Pro configuration. I say this because this is what you see in all the pictures. Uh, it's not clear to me whether any of these really existed or shipped. I haven't talked to anyone who's really seen one. It is clear that Sphere was very intent on moving towards a eight-inch floppy-based system with a printer. Uh, they did have a parallel board. Uh, this configuration was very expensive. This was before the five and a quarter inch discs and getting a dual eight-inch floppy thing was like a lot of money. And they didn't have a DOS yet, although they were working on one. And so I, I don't know whether, uh, whether, whether this existed, but it would have looked like this. So you have the sphere unit, you have the printer, and you have the, the disks with it. So uh, they, did, they did work on a, a, a DOS and some version of it sort of emerged later. I have, I have yet to recover or find a copy of it. I hope to, if anyone in this audience has that, come talk to me. Uh, so that was a serious pro configuration. Uh, here's Mike uh, sitting at the workbench showing off uh, a, test, uh, a test run on a sphere. Again, it's the leisure suit. Um, he's got a couple of the boards on the, on the table. Uh, they're connected with the, the power supply is over there on the right. You got a monitor over on the left. He's probably got the CPU and the CRT boards there. Uh, and you'll notice that they are connected in this unusual way. Spheres did not use a backplane or a motherboard or a hard thing that things plugged into. Uh, Sphere was modular, that was the intention. It was also intended to be easy to debug on a table like this. But what that meant was the way they hooked it up was the bus ran through four ribbon cables that plugged into every board in the system. So it kind of looked like this. There were these four bus plug, four bus cables. Addresses interrupts were in the first two, data was in the third one, and then power, uh, the power rails were in the ribbon cable on the fourth one. Uh, so that's a, that's, a, that's a lot. You can see here, uh, this is the memory board again. You can see across the top, those are the four plugs. The three on the left are the address and data, and the one on the right is, is power. Um, uh, this is what one of the, the cables look like. Sphere would give these to you because they are very hard to make yourself, it turns out, as early users found. Uh, so Sphere would validate these and make these in-house and send them out. Here, this one has seven connectors, but you'll notice they're just dip connectors. These are not interlocking, mechanical locked anything. These are just chip sockets and things that plug into chip sockets. Uh, and if you're now imagining a computer that has cards in a card cage and four or five boards in it, all of which are connected by ribbon, 14 pin ribbon cable buses and maybe other connections to keyboards and other stuff, you might start to imagine what the back of a sphere looked like when you opened it up. Um, this was, uh, this was a challenge, uh, not, as, not aesthetically, because you'd cover it up, but, uh, but mechanically, uh, it worked well on that table configuration. This was a bit of a challenge when you, uh, when you uh, moved the computer or wiggled something or needed to access something, because some of those pins would kind of work their way out and you maybe wouldn't know. And so stuff would start maybe going flaky on you. So longtime users of the system would like tape them on there or clamp them on there, or sometimes they'd solder different wiring across uh, to get better ground, uh, ground paths uh, for, the, for the power or to, to get more, more clear signals. Uh, I'll also mention for the electrical engineers in the room that these cables were not terminated either on the cable or on the boards. Uh, so depending on how you had it configured, you could also see some electrical uh, electrical ringing and other and other challenges. Um, that was that was a true. So a lot of people who got spheres faced this sort of thing and and may have given up early, maybe too early, um, because this sort of this sort of mechanical challenge was was a little was a little tough for them. It's just an interlude picture. <laughs> <laughs> 
I love the marketing photos. All right, so I talked about the program development system. This was the firmware that came with the Sphere. Uh, and I want to tell you what you got in the program development system. This is early, remember, this is 1975, and this is a microcomputer that you can buy and use at home. Would you believe I can give you a full screen editor with full cursor motion and scrolling? I can give you a mini assembler? I'll throw in a debugger, and if that's not enough, I'm going to give you 16-bit multiply divide routines, because those are going to be useful in your input environment, and I'm going to give you text to numeric conversion routines. All this software, firmware, fit into four uh, erasable programmable read-only memories. These are the very ancient Intel 1702As. They each hold 256 bytes. Altogether, that is one kilobyte of program code. And if you're not impressed by all that capability in one kilobyte, I'm going to show you what one kilobyte looks like. That's the entire sphere of firmware. Quick copy it down. You have to trust me. This has everything in it. I checked. The init and the commands are at the top, the editor, the assembler, the debugger, the utility routines. This is an incredibly impressive feat of software engineering. Uh, and this is like head and shoulders above what you could get with, with equivalent systems elsewhere. But with so little room for code, you might say that this system was not especially user friendly. Uh, or, or obvious to use. There was a, a large manual, as you might expect, and it did some unconventional, it had some unconventional ways of interacting with it. Uh, it was not super user friendly, which may be why this woman here running her dry cleaning store, just having spent $4,000 on a fully complete assembled sphere machine, is nonplussed at the fact that she now has to program an assembler uh, setup for her store. Um, but I, 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 I joke, but, uh, but I, sphere really was serious about about the business applications of this machine. And early on, uh, that was hard to achieve. Uh, but very quickly in this era, in this Florence and the Renaissance era of technology, that kind of software did emerge. But there wasn't a third party software industry here at the time. It's important to understand that. So the way you'd write code is you'd get this piece of paper, it would come with the manual, you'd photocopy it a bunch, you'd write stuff on the right hand side your operands, your labels. You, you write out your assembly code by hand with comments, because that's good practice. And then you translate it somewhat onto the left-hand side. You'd use one of these, a little pocket fold-out card that had all the op codes on it uh, and all the architecture information. And then you'd end up with something like this. Uh, and you'd have, uh, the, you'd have this sort of nearly, done, nearly assembled code on the left. It, then you'd enter this into the Sphere mini assembler. And it looks like you're already done here. It really was just a mini assembler, but it did compute relative branches and it did compute some of the address modes for you. Uh, so it did some of the work and certainly in comparison to the lights and switches computer, this is like light years more useful than that. So the users began trading software, as you did in those days, and Sphere, as a good company would, had a newsletter and people could send in programs and tell people that they could get copies of them if they sent in a few bucks. So Sphere had this global news, uh, the swap newsletter for the whole earth. I like that, it's like the one touch of California in this Utah company. Um, one touch of 1970s California. So here we can see tape directory listy by, by Tom Crosley, multiple base adding and calculator, super hot stuff, a printer driver, player control boxes. Look, Scott Adams is already doing games at this point. Um, tiny basic uh, work as well as at least one full assembler, probably several. Again, it seems unlikely that these, uh, that these children would be able to do much with a sphere machine out of the box, but uh, again, and unironically, I, the, the scope of the ambition of the company genuinely did include uh, uses like this. They figured they'd get there. So speaking of the company, let's go back to Bountiful. So. Uh, uh, Sphere had been out based out of Mike Wise's house for the summer of 1975, but they were producing stuff and they needed a real office, they had a bunch of people, so they rent this office in, also in Bountiful. Uh, it used to be a, a drive-in hamburger stand, that's why there's a big parking lot in the front. There's Mike in his leisure suit. Uh, and into this building they had uh, sales, marketing, production, software engineering, hardware engineering, drafting, the whole thing. And administrative secretarial work was all in this very small building. Uh, 
that's a, that's a lot, and you won't be surprised to know that they didn't stick around in this office long. But they did have, as a company, they had a they had a really nice vibe. They had free lunches and dinners, and I point this out because this was like it was an early computer, but it was an early startup, like an early modern startup. So Mike loved the idea of his team eating together and being able to be a family provided for by the company. So uh, they'd run out and get cold cuts for lunch, or they'd bring in pans of homemade lasagna. Mike's older sister worked there uh, and, and baked lasagna sometimes for dinner. Um, it was a lovely place to work. Everybody who worked there really liked working there. Um, this they outgrew this place quite quickly. Uh, I love this building. It's this cool kind of mid-century building. It's still there and Bountiful. Uh, it's been a used car lot for most of the last 50 years. Uh, there it is in kind of the back right corner. CNS Automobile, we have you car. So Sphere moves to a larger office in North, Sal in North Salt Lake. North Salt Lake is just a town over from Bountiful. They rent this entire building. Uh, the top floor is all the is engineering offices, sales, admin, and the whole basement is production. And we have a couple photos of that, which I love. Forgive the crease in the middle of it. Um, here you can see in the, in the foreground, you can see people assembling kits. You can see parts bins over on the wall. In the back, people are assembling other stuff or, or putting together marketing or, or other material to send out. Uh, here's a line of a line of sphere sort of assemble cases getting getting ready. You can see there's the there's the card cage without the keyboard. There's the card cage on the right. You can see the CRT board sitting there. Uh, there's the video display kind of built in on the left, uh, and they're all getting kind of burned in. One super fun tangent about this that I'm I'm going to share because uh, I get such a kick out of it is that this is not a this is not an OEM part video display. This is a Sanyo VM uh, whatever monitor. It's the same one that you see with the Apple Ones and the Apple Twos. Uh, they were popular for computers in this era. Uh, what Sphere did was they bought these things, either retail or wholesale, they removed the top case, they cut the sheet metal on the front bezel above the controls, they drilled holes in the bezel and mounted it to the back panel, the back of that front panel. Uh, here you can see a, a dusty sphere system with that evident. That's the top part of the monitor. The bottom part is bolted into the into the case itself. They didn't modify it at all. They just took the cover off. And so the the internal video plug just goes into like the back of a monitor. Uh, but they wanted to have those controls, like the brightness and the volume controls, and so they pointed them downwards and they bolted those to the bottom of the case and drilled holes in the bottom. So you could adjust the monitor if you like lifted up the computer and twiddled the, uh, the, the pots on it, and they took off all the, you know, the, um, the covers. Um, I just think that's kind of a riot, so I like to, I like to share the story. Another man using a sphere, this is one of the employees is in the office, you can see the, this is the engineering drafting table and you can see the CRT board circuit layout on the wall behind him. That building also still exists today in North Salt Lake, it's currently the home of a psychologist's office, a travel agency and I think a yoga studio. But back to 76, so now we're in early 76. Uh, Sphere has shipped out a whole bunch of kits. The market is starting to get hot, both for them and for other folks. Sphere was financing themselves the way a lot of companies did at the time. They were taking checks today and using them to fund the orders from like a month ago. Uh, this is how a lot of early computer companies funded themselves. Uh, they had money pouring in, uh, but they had orders backlogged. So there was this incentive to like keep getting more orders so we can catch up on the stuff in the backlog. Uh, that was a challenge for every company. It was a challenge for Sphere. Um, among, among other things that happened in the spring after they moved his office is Mike Wise leaves the company. There's some, uh, there's some contention about exactly what the history there is, but he leaves. He's the founder and the visionary. And to be clear, uh, he, he was beloved by the employees. He, he was considered to be a genius and a visionary by all the people who he worked with. Uh, people would talk to him and he'd stop them in the middle of what they were saying and give them an idea that like no one had ever come up with before. Uh, he, was, he was an incredibly smart man and he really did, he was the one that figured out where the product roadmap was going. So without him, the company's only been around for a year, and without him, 
to sort of help set the roadmap, there are some challenges and kind of headwinds for them. They did have good stuff in the pipeline. They had this plan for this Microsphere 200. Uh, this started going out in advertisements in the early in early 1976. Again, before the Apple One, uh, it looks like a later home computer because it was designed to be basically that. That was the, what they sort of understood the market to want. Uh, they did some prototype stuff in house. Uh, it says announcing the world's most advanced low cost computer system available today. Narrator, it was not available today. Uh, they never shipped a microsphere. That is a plaster model. Um, uh, but uh, but it was. But I, I I bring it up because it points to that they had the strategic acumen uh, where they were really kind of skating to where the puck was going, or they were trying to, um, despite sort of other other headwinds going on. They talk about bitmap graphics, you know, some other stuff. Uh, they also refurbed and rethought some of their existing product line. There were incremental improvements. Most of the products remained basically as they had been, you know, that those different components and modules. Uh, but there were small changes. The, they repackaged the high-end version into something they call the Sphere 500. Uh, this is a promo shot for that. Uh, and uh, they also issued an 80 column card, so their original video card had been, had been fairly low resolution for text. And so they, as, as was becoming the standard, they said they issued an updated one. Um, but, uh, but in the end, uh, this, this was not quite enough to, to, to reel Sphere back from the edge. Uh, they were also, fa their, their user community, you can also imagine, they had this hardware and this chip platform that were not the ones that were becoming the standard. Over in S100 land, you had everybody building 8080 and Z80 software and hardware and plug boards and all sorts of stuff. And the 6800 market was just a lot smaller. And Sphere had this sort of quirky hardware configuration that didn't really generate third party uh, third-party hardware edition. So Sphere was really on their own. Uh, they were shipping their own version of BASIC, uh, which had some challenge, which had some uh, technical challenges to it, and so people would tend to bootleg BASIC and use Tiny BASIC from other places. Uh, and their their DOS uh, probably did get completed in some form, but uh, but by March or April of 1977, uh, Sphere was gone. Uh, they they went under. They there there's a kind of complicated and some kind of interesting story about about the way in which that happened. They so they there was a potential acquisition by a local defense contractor to kind of save the save the product line that kind of didn't work. But anyway, Sphere Sphere disappears. And so by the time of the West Coast Computer Fair in 1977, that famous watershed event that we're all familiar with, the Apple II and all the other stuff going on, Sphere was gone. Not only were they not there, the company didn't exist anymore. So from the high to the low, to the end of the show from 75 to early 77 um, and very soon Sphere was so Sphere was a, a small a small systems a small scale systems provider early on they became a, a punchline in some of the magazines and then very quickly they became a footnote or not mentioned at all as the industry kind of moved on there was a little bit of an afterlife with Sphere in a couple ways uh, both for the computer itself and for the user community. Uh, a company out of Denver licensed the hardware designs, a company called Inex, and they put out a computer, or they designed a computer called the Total Computer 4000, uh, which was essentially a Sphere 500 and a slightly different package. Uh, they were building their own firmware for it. It was a, uh, a disk-based only system. Here's the inside of it. You can see they've, they've remedied some of the physical and mechanical challenges with the, the cabling. Uh, they've also moved the full power supply into the, into the, the unit. Um, it's unclear whether, whether any of these actually made it to market. Um, and INEX decided to change plans. They were an industrial inspection company. They were not a microcomputer company. But in the software world, there was a company called uh, Programma, Programma Consultants or Program International out of LA, a man named Mel Norell, and I'd love to have a picture of him, but I don't, so I put this up instead, it's a brochure. Uh, Mel Norell started this company, Programma, in uh, 1975 or six, and he did some con tech consulting work, and then he opens his office in the basement of the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, and he decides he's gonna be a software publisher. And also important to note that there weren't really software publishers at this time, but he gets a sphere, and he likes the sphere, so he decides he's gonna publish software for the Sphere. And he gears up to do this and he starts getting agreements with some of the folks who'd been building these little, little and larger programs for the Sphere. Uh, and, and then Sphere goes under. And Mel Norell is pissed. Uh, 
because he has started this kind of business and kind of invested in being a software distributor, this new industry that he's helping create, uh, and the company he's trying to support goes away. So uh, what Mel does is he sends out this letter to the entire Sphere user base, and he says, hey, I'm going to be your guy. Programma is going, to, is going to sell you software. You can distribute your software through me. Uh, we're going to help carry uh, old pieces of hardware to help fix your machines. We're going to support you, and we're going to put together a, a news, uh, user newsletter. Uh, Mel puts out uh, bunches, of, bunches of software. Most of it comes, around, uh, comes out around the time Sphere closes or after. Uh, the Pi text editor had a long life in other forms, but it began uh, under the name of the PDS Improved Editor, and it was an improved full screen editor for doing work on the, the Sphere. Uh, this, is a, this is a Sphere cassette. You can see in the bottom left, uh, that information was required to load information on a, to load a tape on a sphere. The first two characters are like a file name. There's like this two character block name. Uh, the next number is the load address, and you don't need the last number, but it tells you how big the, the program is. Uh, you had to, unlike other Motorola systems or unlike some other platforms, you had to provide the, the load address was not part of the, uh, the storage format. Here are a couple other, a couple other tapes. Here is a version of Fourth that was released by Programma and SPLM, which is a small PLM uh, compiler. Uh, a, a little birdie tells me that somebody is working on a newer and improved version of Fourth for Sphere, uh, will in the, in the modern day, and we'll we'll see how that goes. Uh, but the other stuff that Programma sold was games, and here's a list of games. You send in your five bucks, and you get a cassette tape back. Uh, and these games, if you've spent any time in early microcomputer land, you'll recognize a lot of these as being from the big 101 basic games book. So these were not like Call of Duty complexity games uh, or even Oregon Trail. These are, uh, these are small games, but often adapted or specific to Sphere and, and in some cases using, using that full screen, full screen capability. Oh, demo. Uh, as part of, so as part of this project, um, as part of this research and book project I've done, I've built a small Sphere web emulator. Uh, it's on the web. You are all welcome to use it, whatever you like. Uh, but I'm going to show you a little bit of it now. So it's a sphere.computer uh, slash emulator. Uh, and this is what the Sphere would have looked like when it came up. It had a blinking cursor. Uh, I will, there's not... These machines, you know, they didn't do like all that much, even though they could do stuff out of the box. So there's not like a ton of super sexy stuff to show you. Uh, but I can show you, I can do control E and now I'm in the editor mode. And I can move the cursor anywhere I want on the screen. This is the original firmware running. And I can scroll down and up. And that was pretty rad. If I hit escape, now I get this prompt and it means it's put me directly into the debugger. The debugger lets me examine memory, change memory. I can set a breakpoint if I want to run stuff, but I'm going to open location 100 hex. That's the value that's there. I can increment and look through some other stuff. I can go back. Uh, I can do space and change the value it there. Go back. Now it's changed. This is using a microcomputer in 1975. Super exciting. Uh, but. I can hit escape and now I'm back to the executive mode. This is a slightly modified version of the firmware that lots of users ended up using in the late 70s after Sphere closed that was easier to load a tape with. So I've got some of the Sphere tapes here. Uh, this one courtesy of BitSavers. Uh, this is the game life. So the way you load it is you push L for load. Uh, you, you type in LI, this would have been on the tape, it's the name of the block, uh, slash, and then the load address. Hit escape, it loads it off the tape, much slower than that in real life. Uh, and then you can op enter the debugger, you can open location 200, and you can hit go, and now I'm playing the life game. It took me a while to figure out that what this does is it takes whatever junk you put on the screen, when you hit escape, it does that. And that's cool. You could do this in 1975 on this. All right. Uh, oh. Mike Wise is not here to accept his applause, but uh, I, hope that he, I hope that he's paying attention. Uh, you can also, I, I, as part of learning how this worked, I also, uh, um, I also wrote a little snake game because nobody had written one, it turned out, and I made a tape image, but it's easier to just hit this button, so uh, if you get sick of playing the life game or the shooting stars game, you can play snake. Ta-da. <laughs> there we go. Um, there's a demo, it's sphere.computer, and there's a link to the... The, uh, the thing if you want to check it out. Uh, we continue.
So the Sphere user community has this afterlife for several years too. These two, the program, Mel Norell, finds these two dentists. Now these dentists were also computer hobbyists and Sphere users, but they were in fact dentists, and he convinces them to run the user newsletter. And they do. So for several years after the collapse of Sphere, there is a small, tight-knit, uh, and productive and prolific, in fact, user community building and sharing and porting software, hardware solutions, tips and tricks. And as the industry starts to move on, how can we put a 6809 in this machine? How can we rig up these five and a quarter inch floppy disks? Nobody had the real sphere disk system, but lots of people jury rigged uh, five and a quarter inch systems or other eight inch systems because a lot of folks were, they were engineers of various stripes and they could figure out how to do it, so they did. Uh, so this, this gets Xeroxed and, and sent out and it goes all the way until May of 1981. This is a long time. This is six years after Sphere was, was announced. It was four years after the company disappeared and there were still people who were actively using the system and were communicating with each other. And that's super, it's super impressive to me uh, that it lasted this long. Of course, what happens later in 1981 is IBM releases the PC and at this point, the folks who were using the Sphere, who were doing real work with it, who were using it in their businesses and using it in their offices, at this point, there was really no way to put, to have, the Sphere could no longer compete against what was showing up in the marketplace. So most of these people at this point mothballed or ditched their Spheres and they, and they ended up with, uh, with IBM machines. So that was the end of the, that was kind of the end of the line for, for Sphere. Um, so back to Mike Wise, he left Sphere in 76. He was a serial entrepreneur. Um, he was an entrepreneur and kind of a visionary through his life. He very, but, but through a whole bunch of very unusual and, and often uh, differing kinds of companies. He started a construction job, costing account, job cost accounting firm uh, in the late 1970s, which amazingly still exists today, selling software for construction job cost accounting. It's called A-Systems, it's in Salt Lake. Um, and he worked there, ran that for a number of years. He did contract work for NASA. He did a bunch of consulting work for a bunch of folks. He started a, uh, a web portal for Utah in the 90s in the era of the web portals. That was probably what he was working on when he was at the Vintage Computer Festival. Uh, Mike struggled with, uh, with obesity for most of his life. He struggled with uh, diabetes for a lot of the, the end of it. He was probably uh, fairly or mostly blind by the time that he gave the VCF talk in 1999. Uh, and he died in 2002, uh, complications of diabetes. He was 53. Uh, a man who worked with him at Sphere and knew him well told me this. To those of us who knew and loved Mike Wise, he was gravity and we were all drawn to his genius and enthusiasm. And I thought that was a, a, a lovely statement. So the legacy of Sphere uh, it was Scott Adams, cuts his teeth on the sphere, ends up building, building adventure games. Tom Crosley writes the Pi Editor, which ends up selling across the Apple II line later. Programma was one of the earliest software distributors for the micro world, uh, and they focused on sphere for a long time. Uh, there were team lunches. That was pioneering. Um, but there was also memory mapped video that was early for that and it led the way, pointed the way towards something that really became the totally de facto standard like very soon after that, within a couple years. But they were really kind of at the forefront of that. Um, the microsphere, although it never released, it clearly shows a strategy indicating that they were skating to where the puck was going. They kind of knew what was happening. Uh, some of their work uh, rather directly influenced the Radio Shack TRS-80. That's a that's a more complex story uh, that that uh, that uh, will appear that I'll, will appear another time, but. Uh, but finally, uh, control alt delete. Mike Wise was uh, proud of that and bragged about that throughout his entire life, and it, and it seems that that was a that that was a justified brag. Um, so. Uh, Here's a link to the resources. I put this little web page together. It's where I'm hosting resources and doing investigations and posting stuff. Check out the emulator. Hope you enjoy it. Um, feel free to sign up for updates. I made one of those little mailing list things. It's going to be like a low frequency, no spam thing. Uh, if you're interested in Sphere, its history, or potentially, uh, potentially a book eventually uh, when that's ready. Um, I want to uh, I want to thank you folks for coming. I want to thank uh, VCF for for having me. Uh, I also want to thank the Computer History Museum's archives, who've been uh, immeasurably immeasurably valuable uh, in in working on this project, as well as uh, some folks who are uh, who are here at this festival today, and uh, and they know who they are. Um, and I thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions you have.
if indeed there are any. <laughs> uh, I should say, uh, I meant to say too, if anyone in the audience was a sphere, I, I've met this one. Uh, if, any, uh, if anyone else was, or if anyone here was here to watch Mike Wise's talk in 1999, or knows people who were, or uh, has or is familiar with any Sphere stories, memorabilia, uh, material, software, hardware, please get in touch, find me afterwards, or drop me an email, or get in touch with me. Um, I'd love to speak with you. Uh, the research net, I, I'm casting it as wide as I, as wide as I can to capture, capture all the stories I can. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. What's that? Uh, I live in San Francisco, and in the way of large cities, people discard things they don't want on the sidewalk. And one day, between two broken chairs and a CD tower, was a pile of like old computer parts. And I'm an old computer person, and so I stopped and couldn't. It looked like a, an old tele, an old terminal. Um, and I have a lot of old computer junk, and I didn't want to necessarily accumulate more from the sidewalk. Uh, <laughs> But I, I looked close and I saw Sphere 1975. I'd never heard of it. And I'm both a history person and a computer person and a technology. And I, and I couldn't believe I'd never, I Googled it on my phone. I couldn't believe I'd never heard of it. So I just kind of dragged it home and started restoring it. Uh, thinking it was kind of a fun hobby project and then kind of came to realize that uh, that it, there are these sort of untold stories about it. It really, it, it was this footnote in all these histories and I thought it deserved more than that. It seemed, like a, it seemed like there was a more interesting story there. And so that sort of became the historian part of me kicked in and I love doing the, 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 um, the computer, the geeky stuff too, obvious, obviously. Um, but but, I'm, but getting, the, getting the histories and the stories is, is super fascinating to me. And so I'm, I'm putting it together in a book. It's become a real labor of love. Huh? Yes? Say that again. Uh, how many systems were sold? Uh, it's a great question that nobody seems to really know the answer to. Mike Wise himself at the, at the VCF show 20 some years ago apparently said there were like somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 units. Uh, Mike wasn't, of course, there the whole time. It's a little, that's, that's probably okay as a ballpark, but, but I don't really know. Um, they don't. They don't seem to turn up super often. Um, there are a, there are a couple of them. One of the newsletter editors, one of the dentists. His entire collection is is what forms the Computer History Museum Spear collection. Um, he was an early donor to the Boston Computer Museum of his of his materials, which is is super valuable for research. Um, and they're they're kind of scattered around, but I, I I I'm not. I couldn't tell you what the number is. Nobody seems to remember. Yes. They don't seem to, yeah. Uh, it's, it's sort of, what's kind of funny is that they're not even really branded. I don't know if you've noticed that in the photos. It's like a kind of generic sheet metal case. And I mean, the company's got like a cool logo. So, you know, they were kind of like, they were think they had some vibe on, on kind of branding. But uh, I, asked, I asked somebody why, why the case was unbranded. They're like, well, we, we were busy. Like, we didn't have to, like, <laughs> we didn't have to, we didn't have time for that. Like, the people who sent us checks needed their, they needed, they needed their stuff, you know, so we sent it out. Um, yeah. Well, I'll be around. Thank you so much for coming. It was wonderful to have you. I appreciate it.